And then in 2001, Osiris broke skateboarding. What's up guys, my name is Levi and this is Shred Shop connecting you to skateboarding and today we are doing the entire history of skateboard shoes. Today we're going to take a deep dive into skateboard shoes and how they evolved over time. We're going to take a look at new technologies and trends and how that evolved with skateboarding at the time and as well we're going to relate it to and go over what was happening in skateboarding at the time and why they needed those shoes. So it's basically a history video but it's a fun history video because you're going to understand how skateboard shoes came about today and what dudes had strapped to their feet when they did the gnarliest tricks you've ever seen. Oh, gnarly! So we're gonna go way back, back before your parents had sex to make you back in the 1950s. Before the 1950s, people were making skateboards in their garages, maybe in their art houses, maybe on the toilet, they're sculpting skateboards, I don't know. But in the 1950s, that was the first commercially made skateboards and they were sold in grocery stores. Right next to the bread aisle, between the milk and cheese and the Spam. One of the first brands to make these boards was the Roller Derby. There's more stuff that we could say about the 50s, but screw the 50s, I wasn't even born Yet, let's go to the 60s. In 1962, Val Surf was the very first store to ever sell skateboards, making it the world's very first skateboard shop. Also in the 60s, Skateboarder Magazine arrived, making it the very first skateboard magazine. At the time, skateboards are usually just used more to cruise around and just get from point A to point B, and most people are doing it barefoot. As you can see on this Life Magazine cover, Patty McGee riding her skateboard barefoot. As skateboarding progressed even just a little bit, people were tired of their toenails getting ripped off, getting infections, and tons of other foot fungus, so they decided to wear very thin little shoes, Converse's or Keds. This still maintained that barefoot feel that people loved while riding a skateboard. Skateboards. In 1965, the Randolph Rubber Company releases the very first ever skateboard ad for skateboard shoes. It was called the Randy 720 Skateboard Shoe, and they advertised they had tough rubber on the toe and the heel for skateboarding. These shoes sold for $14.95. A year later, in 1966, the Van Doren Rubber Company launches in Anaheim, California. They made custom deck shoes with whatever kind of fabric you wanted on top, and their rubber waffle soles, which became famous all throughout the world. Enough with that decade. I wasn't even born yet. On to the 70s. In 1972, the polyurethane wheel is invented by Frank Nosworthy. This changed skateboarding forever because previous to that, skateboards had to stay on the ground. Now, skateboards could ride up pool walls, tricks could happen, things changed. Skateboarding and tricks took a huge leap forward and so skateboard footwear had to do the same. The Van Doren Rubber Company would eventually change their name to their nickname, Vans. In 1976, Stacy Peralta and Tony Alva teamed up with Vans shoes to create the world's first ever skateboard shoe designed by skateboarders. It was called the Style 95, but we know it today as the Vans era, and it still is one of the most popular skateboard shoes ever. A year later, they released the Style 36, and that's what we know today as the Vans Old School. At that time, a lot of the knick-knack skateboard companies were trying to fit in, trying to grow, so they tried to hop on the trend, and they decided to make their own skate shoes as well. Hobie made skate shoes. Even Makaha made skate shoes. In the late 70s, a lot of skateboarders also veered out and tried different shoes to skate. They were skating tennis shoes and basketball shoes, Adidas, Converse, Nike, even Puma. And near the end of the 70s, as skateboarding is progressing, tricks are progressing, and the risk of getting hurt and getting smacked in the ankles is also going up, you see an upswing in people moving towards high top shoes. In 1978, skateboarding changed forever because Alan Gelfin invented the Ollie. This brought in a new problem for skate shoes, a new wear zone, because before you would just wear out the bottom of your shoes and now you would to turn your foot and drag it up for the ollie wearing out the top of your shoes. Although pretty cool so far, the 70s can still fart on everything. I wasn't even born yet, on to the 80s. Moving into the 80s, skateboarding was progressing like crazy and so the skate shoes had to keep moving ahead. Pool skating, vert skating was going up and street skating began and was starting to take off. In the early 80s, Rodney Mullen took the ollie pop from vert down to flat and then he started inventing flip tricks. 
kick flips, three flips, heel flips, all sorts of tricks, which added a whole new reason to have durable skate shoes. Because before you were just wearing out the bottom of your shoes, now all over the shoe is getting crazy wear. The high tops were still very much a statement point of the 80s because they wanted durable shoes that had lots of protection. In 1986, Etnik's footwear was started. They eventually went on to change their name to Etnies. As well, the same year, Airwalk footwear was started. The reason this is a huge point in skate shoe history is because these two brands were the very first ever brands that started as skate shoe companies. Other ones like the Van Doren Rubber Company started making skate shoes and moving in. These ones started as skate shoe company. In 1987, the Pal Peralta Search for Animal Chin video came out. It was such a huge iconic video. In the intro of that, every single person was wearing Jordan 1 highs, except for Tony Hawk, who was wearing his iconic Van Skate highs. The reason this is crazy is because these guys are the celebrities of the skateboard world. Steve Cab, who was one of those guys, said that that year he sold 250,000 of his pro model board, and yet none of those guys had a pro shoe sponsor. Obviously, after this video came out, it was such a huge deal in the world that so many different skaters started wearing Jordan 1s. People in vert, people in street skating, freestyle skating, everyone was wearing Jordan 1s. In the late 80s, Converse sets its eyes on some of these pros and starts sponsoring people with Chuck Taylors. You also see certain board brands starting to enter the shoe market, like Vision and Santa Cruz, but their silhouettes were a lot like Chuck Taylors. Also in the very late 80s, guys like Tommy Guerrero, Mark Gonzalez, and Nautis are seen skateboarding through the streets, and this is the beginning of the growth of street skateboarding. In the late 80s, Nautis and Etnies released the world's first ever pro skateboard shoe. Guys, this was a huge deal because at that time, it was only the top celebrities of each sport that would have their names stitched on a piece of footwear. Guys like Michael Jordan, Stan Smith, Chuck Taylor, and now Nautis was among those men. Even the way they marketed this Nautis Etnies shoe was that he was an elite pro athlete among all these other guys. Within the same year, the Vans Caballero High Top came out for Steve Caballero. Also at that time, you have brands like Airwalk releasing shoes like the Prototype, which is the explosion of the big kind of chunky footwear. And guys, in 1989, the most important fact on this entire list, Levi Switzer is born. That decade wasn't so bad, but they only got one year of the Switz. <laughs> <laughs> On to the 90s. In the 90s, a seismic shift in skateboarding happened. Vert skating and freestyle skating, they all started to kind of die down as street skating took off. It became the main thing that people were about in skateboarding. As skateboarding evolves and street skating starts to blow up, the needs of the skater at that time and what they prefer as they're skating change. And so obviously the shoe had to adapt. Someone who's launching out on a vert ramp is not going to want the same kind of shoe as someone who's jumping down a set of stairs. In 1992, Steve Caballero sees that a lot of people are cutting down his Caballero high top. They're cutting off the top collar to be a little bit lower like a mid, putting stickers or duct tape around there to keep the foam in. He realizes this, tries it himself, and then phones up Vans and says, listen, we need to make an updated version, a mid top of the same shoe. For me, being a trendy person, I ended up doing that myself. So I started cutting them and I think around the second or third pair, I was like, I was over it. I was like, why don't we just make it like that? <laughs> From that, Vans releases the half cab shoe. It blows up instantly, becomes an instant classic, even till today, 30 years later. You would not be able to find a single pro who hasn't owned a pair of half cabs. In June of 1994, Damon Way and his college friend Ken Block decide to steer their clothing company in towards the footwear industry. They take the name Drawers Clothing and they turn it into DC Shoes. They launch the brand with pro skater... <laughs> They launch the brand with pro skaters like Danny Way and Colin McKay, and they have an interesting launch strategy where they flood the market with tons of different pro model shoes, which at that time, pro model shoes were still pretty scarce. There was only a few out there. In the year 1995, Airwalk gives a pro model shoe to Tony Hawk and yes, the celebrity actor, Jason Lee, who was a pro skater first. Also in 1995, S Footwear starts. It's a sister company to Etnies. They came right out the gates with two iconic shoes that were their best selling shoes ever. It was the Sal 23, shoe, which they pulled over from Etnies, and the SXL shoe. You can see the very quick shift in skateboard styles on the shoes that they liked. Because just five years earlier, people were still wearing high tops, maybe just starting to cut off the top to make them into half cabs. But five years later, in 95, S launches, and you see the puffy kind of padded low top, more of a fresh style. In 1996, Levi Switzer starts skateboarding. <laughs> 
And as we shift into the later 90s, you see a bunch of new skateboard footwear companies surfacing and starting to make shoes because the industry is growing. You have Etnies America, which later switched to America. You have Sheep Shoes, Hookup Shoes. You have Globe Footwear, DVS, Osiris, Action, Audio, Lakai. Among all those skateboard shoe brands that are getting into the market, in 1996, Nike makes their first attempt at skateboard shoes. The thing is, skateboarding didn't take too well to big companies like Nike coming in and trying to take a piece of the pie. So it was a short-lived effort on Nike's part. They did leave us with these amazing ads like, what if we treated all athletes like we do skateboarders? Excuse me! Oh, no! Hold your horses there, Mac and Roll. You see the sign? I've seen you guys playing tennis here before. Hey! Hey, 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 hey! Off the fence. Couple of monkeys up there. Game over. The night's done. Jackasses. Another really cool thing that happened in the 90s, in 1999, Vans teamed up with Carabeth to create the very first ever woman's skate shoe. And Adidas gets back into the skate shoe game, picks up Mark Gonzalez, and drops a Mark Gonzalez Pro Model shoe. In 1999, Osiris drops the iconic, heard around the entire world, chunky D3 Dave Mayhew shoe. Everyone's seen it, most people had it, and most people got sick to their stomachs after they wore it. That decade wasn't so bad if you ask me. Levi's started skating. On to the 2000s. In the year 2000, Levi landed his first kickflip. <laughs> People would be like, shut this freaking idiot up. As we move into the 2000s, skateboarding has taken some serious leaps of faith. You heard it right. Just a few years earlier, Jamie Thomas was jumping down the leap of faith, as well as a ton of other skateboarders jumping down huge stuff. And so skateboard shoes again had to adapt. They had to be stronger, more comfortable, and handle way higher impact. And here we begin the height of the chunky shoe era. The shoe industry felt like they needed to create something that would handle higher impact. So we get potato looking shoes and skin tight Cory Duffel jeans, D3s, ladies jeans. In the early 2000s, just prior Prior Tony Hawk Pro Skater, the video game, had just dropped. So popularity was rising. Mainstream eyes were getting a lot more on skateboarding. And skateboarding was becoming cool. So we see people who had no idea anything about skateboarding wearing S, Etnies, Vans, whatever. They were wearing skate shoes. It was the cool thing to do. In the year 2000, Andrew Reynolds survives Y2K and drops his first ever pro model shoe with America. Also in the year 2000, Savior Footwear made its debut under Nike. And then in 2001, Osiris broke skateboarding by bringing us the D3 2001. We had people like Avril Lavigne wearing it. Joe Biden wore it. Fred Durst was wearing it. Notorious B.I.G. was wearing it. Tupac. Kid Rock even wore it. Hillary Clinton got a custom one made with a heel. People were loving this shoe. Savior was short-lived. And so in 2002, Nike made their third attempt into skateboarding with their Nike SB shoe line. This time, they launched it strategically by releasing a bunch of dunks with the crazy heritage of the Dunks and the Jordan Highs, this was something people knew, something people had a story and rapport with, so they were ready to jump on board. This third attempt was obviously extremely successful. It's where we see Nike and skateboarding today. At that time, skateboarding was blowing up so much that the core shoe brands were opening up wide and started to sell in kind of mall stores. And so because of that, there now became room for Nike to come in and have a shoe on the wall in the core skate shop. Two years later, Nike solidified their spot in the skateboarding game by adding P rod to their pro model team. This was a turning point for skateboarding because P-Rod was someone that all skateboarders looked up to. So if he said something like moving from a core brand like S to Nike SB was okay, then now it opened up a whole new world and market of how skateboarders were going to spend their money within skateboarding because corporate sponsorships now started to become okay. Also in the mid 2000s, you start to see brands launching in the shoe industry like Fallen, Zoo York, Element, Vox, DGK, and Supra. In 2008, Levi Switzer gets his very first ever sponsor, Shred Skateboard Shop. Welcome to the team, Levi.
And then in 2009, Gravis launches into shoes. Dylan Reader comes out with his first pro model shoe with them. And that was the Dylan Dress Slipper. This again was another little shift or even like a hiccup in skate footwear design because people were moving away from bulky shoes, but they hadn't really found their identity. And this Dylan Reader shoe showed that there was a new side of things that you could look cool on and off your skateboard. You didn't just have to have some crusty old saviers while you're trying to pick up a girl. Also in 2009, Nike releases the Stefan Janowski Pro Model. This shoe has been around forever. It actually made it on Nike's top 100 best-selling shoe wall at their head office. As well, it sits among the best-selling skateboard shoes of all time. Pro Model shoes like the Half Cab, the D3, the Excel, and even shoes like the Reynolds 3. That decade wasn't so bad. Levi landed his first kickflip. Levi graduated high school, got sponsored, but on to the next one. 2010s, baby. In the 2010s, skateboarding is blowing up. It's becoming mainstream as well. The trick lists are getting crazier and crazier. But for shoe design, the shoes are really slimming down, but the tech inside them is ramping way up. As sports brands were on the rise within skateboarding, making skate shoes, they were also bringing in new tech and pushing the envelope when it came to putting tech into a skateboard shoe. And so the core brands had to catch up and they started making their own tech, which we started to see the shoes get better and better and better. So insole technology and durability and other ways to keep your foot comfortable and protected were all coming into play with the shoes. Also, the shoe brands were experimenting with different rubber coating suede and underlay. We see with Vans, they have a Duracap. New Balance has a whole bunch of different stuff. They're adding rubber in the high wear areas for shoes to be able to last longer while not looking bulky or being hard to skate. In the 2010s, we also see an explosion of participation from women in skateboarding, which is really cool because it grows that whole side of the industry with women getting sponsored, becoming pros, and companies actually catching up and giving women the respect and the nod that they needed. I mean, look back. Alyssa Steamer was in Tony Hawk Pro Skater 1 and she didn't even have a pro model. So finally, skateboarding figured it out. In 2010, Huff Footwear launched and that's where we saw some amazing shoes. And then in 2012, New Balance Numeric launched into skateboarding. And then in 2018, Nike releases the Nija Houston Pro Model shoe. It's definitely a nod back to the old Savier shoes made with the similar compound, kind of that rubber plastic toe cap. As well, it's one of the first shoes that we see looking more like a fitness shoe than a skate shoe, but fully skatable. And then we move up to in recent years, we've seen a trend. It's kind of like the death of the pro model shoe. We see brands building their marketing and their brand around a certain few key pros that have pro model shoes, but most pro skaters are riding team shoes or other pro model shoes. It is not like the good old days where every one of your favorite pros had a pro model and you could go out and support them in that way and try to look like Mike Carroll or like Eric Costin or like Danny Way. Over the last decade, we've seen a huge shift in the way people are wearing and skating their shoes because for a while, it was a few huge companies that were kind of running the footwear game within skateboarding. But there is still a lot of skaters that want to be riding core skateboard shoe brands. So they're reaching out and they're riding these small shoe brands that are popping up all over. We have brands like Last Resort, Stray, State, Karyuma, even brands like Clearweather. You have Herman's brand, Ours. And then you see other kind of big companies like Asics and Reeboks reaching their arm into skateboarding a little bit. But it seems that as these big companies are taking over the shoe industry a little bit, people are wanting to find the core brands out there. You also see skaters skating non-skate shoes. You see them skating Stan Smith's or back to Jordan 1's as a throwback. You see even a guy like Ellington skating Linning. As people are diversifying and their voices are getting louder and how they're spending their money and spreading it out, is it the return of the core skateboard shoe? Wow, what a great journey for skateboard shoes. But more importantly, what a great journey for Levi. The last 32 years have been amazing. I was born, I learned how to kickflip, I got sponsored, and finally, I'm washed up. Guys, we're in this together. Guys, let us know below, what is the future for skateboard shoes? Also, what are your three favorite skate shoes of all time? And as always, like you guys do without me asking, remind me how poorly I pronounce things in the comments below. Like, subscribe, and comment if you guys wanna see more content. And if you're out there buying skate shoes, go to your local shop, stay out of the malls and the sports stores. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'm Levi, this is Shred Shop, connecting you to skateboarding, and you just watch the history of skateboard shoes. Stay tuned for comment of the week. Oh, we got a spicy one from my Diggly Dirty Dog, Ernesto Guevara. He says, think they might need another host. Bro, I've got feelings too. <laughs>